Tonight, hockey under a microscope as Team Canada hits the ice. I hope that Hockey Canada is on the right track. The World Junior Championship begins in the shadow of scandal. Ukraine aims for a peace summit, but some say there's no chance. I would certainly not uh, trust President Putin even with $2 if I had to. And canceled flights. Get us home! Get us home! Dashing holiday plans. They could get us out December 30th, but that's, you know, three, four days from now and the tournament's over. This is The National with David Common. Good evening. Adrian is away. A hard defeat tonight for Team Canada at the hands of Czech Republic. Their game ended day one of the World Juniors in Halifax and Moncton, where Canada is defending gold. But beneath the fan excitement, apprehension, the host group, Hockey Canada, has lost sponsors and a good deal of public faith for having secretly paid settlements in response to past allegations of sexual assault by some former Team Canada players. Karen Paul shows us the stakes at this year's tournament. Go Canada, go! Go Canada, go! go, Canada, go. All eyes are on this tournament. Some cheering the return of this hockey holiday tradition. It is real exciting to have the tournament here. While others see it as a test as Hockey Canada tries to move past scandal. They could have done more. Yeah, definitely could have done more. Team Canada officially opened the tournament against Czech Republic in hopes of defending their gold. Back to Zellweger. Zellweger shoots, tip, score! Canada once again goes in as the heavy favourite. This analyst says Team Canada looks strong, but... The U.S. tends to now uh, send heavyweight team after heavyweight team. Sweden should be really good. Finland will be really good as well. What's also good, an economic boost at a traditionally slow time of the year, an estimated $50 million for the region. We know that people will be uh, in the establishments in the downtown, and we want to make sure that those businesses uh, see a lift, a positive lift. But most major sponsors pulled their support after it was revealed that Hockey Canada settled sexual assault claims using money generated from registration fees. Police have since reopened investigations into at least two separate alleged group sexual assaults involving former Team Canada junior hockey players between 2003 to 2018. One of the assaults alleged to have taken place in Halifax in 2003 after Team Canada took home silver. There is no excuse and there is no exception when it comes to, to inappropriate behavior towards, towards women. Experts say Hockey Canada will try to use this event to rebuild its image in Canada and internationally. I think that they want to send a signal that the worst of the scandal is behind them. Hockey Canada required players, coaches and staff to take anti-sexual assault training before the tournament. The New Brunswick government went one step further, tying its funding to good conduct by the players. Observers hope these steps are not just for show. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Toronto. South of the border, at least 28 people have now died in the blizzard that's pummeled western New York. The death toll jumped after workers digging out vehicles found bodies inside. As J.P. Tasker tells us, the crisis is far from over. This was the scene near Josh Thayer's home in Williamsville, New York. More than 100 centimetres of snow. The roads completely impassable. It wasn't just an inconvenience. Thayer's fiance Lexi is a heart transplant recipient. With her medication running low, she had to get out. I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to have a, have a heart transplant and really be dependent on the medicine. Lexi got what she needed this morning, but the anxiety? She handles things well usually, but you know, the past couple days have been really, really stressful. The number of people dead in Western New York is climbing. Workers have begun the daunting task of digging out. Buffalo is used to snow, a lot of it, but this wintry blast was different. We can handle heavy snow. The problem was the winds. We had hurricane force winds over a category one hurricane. There's still a travel ban in place because even some rescuers have been stranded, but not the firefighters at the Buffalo airport. 
that was lucky for the Tinsdale family. Out driving on Christmas Eve with four kids in tow, the conditions turned grim. I can just describe it as it was like looking at a white piece of construction paper. You couldn't see anything at all, like absolutely nothing. After a harrowing rescue, the family spent Christmas at the fire hall. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has deployed the National Guard, 400 troops so far. They're on a search and rescue mission, trying to find motorists who are still buried under a wall of snow. So anyone who declares victory and says it's over, it is way too early to say this is a, at its a completion. President Joe Biden is following the devastation from the White House. He's promising to marshal the full force of the federal government to help. The region will need it. More snow is coming tonight. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Washington. And late tonight, U.S. President Biden coming through on that promise. He has officially authorized federal support for the state of New York. In this country, thousands in Quebec are still without power. Work crews left scrambling. But Hydro-Quebec warned some people could be waiting longer. We are working really hard to restore the vast majority of the people by the end of the day, Wednesday. Nobody will be forgotten. Uh, we will have no surrender and no peace until everybody's connected back. Some 380,000 Quebecers were in the dark at the height of the storm. Most have now seen the lights come back on. Hydro-Quebec has deployed 1,200 workers and 10 helicopters to finish the job. Warming stations have been set up across the affected areas. And while hard-hit cities work to clear the snow, holiday travel remains a nightmare. Whether it's planes, trains or automobiles, some Canadians are wondering if they'll ever get moving again. Lisa Shing looks at that tonight. A quick scan of the departures terminal and it's not hard to find fed up passengers. You know, it's not just me alone. There's a child, my wife is traveling with us. You know, it's frustrating, especially for a child. Flights have been delayed, then cancelled, delayed and cancelled again. This minor hockey team was afraid they'd miss a major tournament in Calgary before finally getting a last minute flight. It's tough. I mean, it's something that these guys have looked forward to. It's an invite-only tournament, so we were fortunate enough we're the only Ontario team going. The backlog after several days of severe winter weather has also marooned hundreds of Canadians abroad, including Rob McClinton and his family, without a flight for six days in Putacana, now rationing their infant daughter's formula. So we can't really drive into a store and buy formula because we don't have that time or that ability because we're always waiting if we're getting picked up and jump on a flight that day. Same for hundreds of Canadians in Cancun who showed up angry at the airport after Sunwing cancelled flights. The company says it's trying its best to arrange hotels and transfers. While air travelers are stranded here at Pearson, many hoping to travel by train are also stuck. There's still no via service between Toronto and Ottawa or Toronto and Montreal after a CN train derailed on Christmas Eve. After some riders reported being stranded for more than 18 hours, Via Rail says those trains will be up and running on a modified schedule on Tuesday. Even local travel is still a slog for the town of Fort Erie, Ontario, hit with massive power outages and whiteout conditions. It's quite startling the number of abandoned vehicles on the, on the roads. Uh, some of them near intersections, in the middle of intersections, uh, some blocking parts of roads. The mayor says cleanup will take several days, but worries about the next big dump of snow. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. In B.C., the shock is still raw after a deadly bus crash on Christmas Eve. Tonight, a clearer picture about what happened. Lindsay Duncombe takes us through those new details. We're getting a sense of just how chaotic the scene of that deadly bus crash was. This image posted online appears to show the bus on its side in the snow, people waiting for help in the cold. And RCMP continued to investigate the cause of the crash, although the initial sense is that extremely icy conditions are to blame. 
The bus was traveling west from Kelowna to Vancouver when it went off the road and rolled on its side in the eastbound lane. No one from the province was available to answer questions today about why that section of road remained open when others were closed. Seven people remain in hospital. None have life-threatening injuries. And police tell us they have been unable to contact all the survivors. Some didn't buy tickets in advance, so names were difficult to track down. And some people were discharged from hospital and just made their way home without speaking to investigators. Police do know there were international travelers on the bus. Police and the bus company are now trying to get them their luggage before they return to their home countries. That stretch of road has now reopened. Although the bus company stopped services after the crash, they are expected to resume tomorrow. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. After a winter already marked by escalating tensions, South Korea scrambled jets and helicopters to intercept a rare threat, North Korean drones. Attack helicopters tried to intercept five drones in South Korea's airspace, the first such incursion since 2017. At least one drone, though, made it back to the north. This latest move comes in a year North Korea conducted a record number of missile tests. Ukraine's foreign minister suggested a possible peace summit with Russia for February, but with conditions. The response from Moscow? Well, Russia has its own demands. Katie Nicholson shows us why the latest talk of diplomacy to end the war may be nothing more than just that, talk. A relentless barrage in eastern Ukraine targets Russian positions. This is where their most capable units are, says this soldier. But we will beat them. Tough talk on the battlefield, but more conciliatory words from Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba. On Boxing Day, telling the Associated Press he's aiming for a peace summit at the UN by the end of February the one-year anniversary of this war. Russia can come, he says, so long as it faces prosecution for war crimes. If this regime remains in power, it's really inconceivable, in my opinion, that somehow you can reconcile holding Russia accountable for the war crimes committed and at the same time negotiate with that same regime. Human rights investigators continue to document alleged Russian war crimes, like the killings of civilians in Bucha earlier this year. And yet, Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly said he's open to negotiation, most recently on Christmas Day. I would certainly not uh, trust President Putin even with $2 if I had to. Putin's war continues to lead to steep losses and strategic slaps in the face. Overnight, Russia claimed it shot down a Ukrainian drone near a key airbase for many of its bombers, 650 kilometers deep into its territory. How many more months can the Russian military withstand these types of troop and equipment and material, material losses? I don't think they can do this for more than six months to a year. Logistics, though, may not be the top concern for a leader who has gambled so much and gotten so little. How does that make Putin look good? So that's why I put this, you know, the prospects of this at 25% uh, or less. And more likely, analysts say, this war will drag on well into a new year. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. Ukrainians have seen their homes and families torn apart by this war. Some have come to Canada to find safety, but the traumas of war have traveled with them. Alison Northcott shows us how one organization in Montreal is helping Ukrainians cope. For Anastasia Solyanik, this therapeutic dance class helps her process her emotions. The free class at the Ukrainian National Federation in Montreal is offered to recently arrived Ukrainians uprooted by the Russian invasion. It was like uh, I was kicked out of my uh, home. Solyanik arrived from Kyiv at the end of August, joined by her husband and eight-year-old son. She has struggled with feelings of helplessness. Dance and therapy, it's very important because all emotions that you have, they are stuck in your body. And if you don't express them, they are stuck even deeper. 
More than 700,000 Ukrainian nationals and their family members have applied for special temporary resident visas to Canada. Settlement agencies can help them find housing, work and navigate the immigration process, but experts say psychological support can be hard to come by, despite some supports available through Canada's immigration ministry. Very strong support early, both from a settlement and a mental health point of view, is extremely important to building healthy people moving forward that then can settle into their new lives. Wednesday for the seniors group. As Ukrainians began arriving in Montreal, members of the Ukrainian community quickly mobilized, creating a wellness program to support them. For something as um, difficult to handle as escaping the war, on top of immigration at a very fast pace here, I think that we are filling in a crucial gap. All we wanted to do is to provide a space for people to reflect on all of these challenges and reflect on their needs uh, and perhaps uh, lessen, if, even if by a little bit, their, the difficult transition. There is also free therapy tailored to Ukrainians' cultural and linguistic needs through an initiative at McGill University. It's navigating the trauma, navigating the difficult emotions that come with it, navigating the other very difficult symptoms of it, so helping them recover. The most important is to continue your life. Even though she didn't want to leave Ukraine, Selyanik says she's working with support from her community to build a new life here in Canada. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In Afghanistan tonight, there is fading hope that foreign aid can be delivered where it's needed after the Taliban barred women from working for NGOs. We're in the middle of winter. There's cases of pneumonia that need treating. Ultimately, if this is not resolved within a week or so, children are going to start dying. Save the Children says about half of its 5,000 staff and volunteers are women and fear that without their help, children in Afghanistan will go without vaccinations and mothers will forfeit prenatal and postnatal care. Today, the top UN official in Kabul met with a Taliban minister on behalf of the NGOs to plead for a reversal. But Save the Children and three other major aid groups have already suspended operations. Watching all of this from Alberta is a former Afghan security guard who fears for his family back home. He did work for Canada's military and he's one of the 40,000 Afghans that Canada has pledged to resettle here. But as Julia Wong shows us, his loved ones are still in danger in Afghanistan, desperate for Ottawa's final approval. And this is you as well? This Afghan man is safe in Canada, but his family back home remains in danger. I'm worried about my family. I cannot sleep well. For his family's safety, CBC News is obscuring the man's identity, using someone else's voice and calling him Abdul. He and his relatives worked as security guards for the armed forces in Kandahar. Abdul resettled in Canada in May. But they're stuck in Afghanistan, being targeted by the Taliban while their refugee applications sit in limbo. My family can get killed. They can get kidnapped. I mean, anything can happen to them. CBC News spoke to Abdul's brother in Afghanistan. We're also protecting his identity. They have beaten me and my son so brutally. We have been raided. We changed the place time and time again. The federal immigration minister acknowledges the difficulty. Without having a presence on the ground, military or diplomatic, uh, in a territory that's been seized by the Taliban, a listed terrorist entity in Canadian law, uh, it creates very real challenges. We're not giving up on these folks. The process has been very slow. A former diplomat in Afghanistan says Canada needs to persuade the Taliban to cooperate. You would have to use a carrot and stick approach. We will give you some concessions and in return um, uh, you will help us process the refugees. Safe now, Abdul's phone rings often. Former colleagues are desperate. Their cases, now his mission. They keep calling me for help, and my answer to them is that nothing is in my control. Abdul says they put their lives in danger to help Canada. Now it's time for Canada to return the favor. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Also hurt by the Taliban's takeover, the Canadian soldiers who served there. I guess the anger might be gone. They share their memories 20 years after the start of the mission. Plus... Technically, we have lots of answers. Socially, we have a lot of hurdles. 
the struggle to bring clean energy to Canada's far north, and no stone is being left unturned as one of the country's most historic buildings undergoes restoration. We're back in two. Across Canada, hundreds of remote communities are not on the electrical grid, instead relying on diesel generators for power. The federal government has committed to phasing them out, but as Kyle Back shows us, the road to renewables is a bumpy one. These rows of solar panels were installed on a college student housing building in the Nunavut capital more than a year ago, but have yet to produce a single watt of electricity. In the meantime, the territory remains dependent on power plants fueled by diesel. Across the country, there are more than 200 remote communities not connected to a regional electricity grid. The majority rely on diesel-powered electricity. The federal government has a goal of phasing out those power plants by 2030. The technology exists, but it's not a simple fix. Nunavut has 25 communities with their own diesel power generator and a small isolated network of power lines, including a Kaluit. The hum of the power plant never stops, 24-7, up on a hill towering over the homes and businesses. Then there's the pipeline that runs right through the community all the way to the storage tanks on the coast. Here, the reliance on diesel isn't in the background, but always present. People in the Arctic are feeling the impacts of climate change more significantly than others around the world. So if there's a way that we can help to mitigate those impacts, then we would like to do that. Heather Shilton is pushing to develop several clean energy projects in the territory. But like the solar panels on the college dorm, the projects are suspended. That's because there's a disagreement about how much the utility company should pay the owners of the solar panels for the electricity that is produced. And we're all stuck. The utility company says keeping costs in check and trying to keep the lights on are the top priorities, not trying to reduce emissions. Right now, the only technology that's able to provide safety, reliability and affordability is diesel. Revamping an energy system in the north isn't cheap or easy, but it can be achieved if there's buy-in from residents, government and industry. Technically, we have lots of answers. Socially, we have a whole lot of hurdles. This community in the Yukon has cut its diesel consumption by nearly 25% since installing this solar project. One day, the goal is to shift away from diesel completely. There was a time I didn't believe 25% was going to happen. So yes, I do believe at some point 100% is going to be able to happen from renewables. It provides inspiration for other communities to cut down on diesel use and power up a new era of clean energy. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Iqaluit. You might not know her name, but you may know her line of cookbooks called Companies Coming. Author Jean Paré has died at the age of 95. She didn't start publishing cookbooks until her 50s, but she wound up writing more than 200 of them. Each had a different theme, like delicious squares or muffins and more. And with that simple recipe, Jean Paré sold 30 million cookbooks and was awarded the Order of Canada. As the situation in Afghanistan deteriorates, Canadian soldiers who serve there are watching it from abroad. We asked some of them, was it worth it? I think we as a country have failed on the back end of our obligations to Afghanistan. 20 years after the start of the war, a remarkable reunion. Plus, the poinsettia that just keeps growing and growing for a Halifax man, it's a reminder that love can always bloom. Our moment is still ahead. As you heard earlier, several aid groups have suspended their work in Afghanistan after the Taliban banned women from working for NGOs. It's yet another example of the eroding rights and freedoms since the Taliban retook control. And a situation Canadian soldiers who served in Afghanistan never imagined would happen 20 years after the start of the war. Earlier this year, I caught up with some soldiers I met during that mission to try to find the answer to a question, was it all worth it? So uh, 20 years ago, I was walking through this same airport and I was a brand new reporter, freaked out and excited about my first big overseas assignment, Afghanistan. David Common, CBC News, Kandahar. 
and I went and met a bunch of Canadian soldiers who themselves were deploying for the first time to a war zone in like half a century. Well, a lot's happened to Afghanistan in the years since, and we've asked, what was it all for? And now those soldiers are holding a reunion, 20 years after the fact, and they've invited me to meet with them. A lot of them I haven't seen in 20 years. There's some very, very close bonds, for sure. Alex Watson was a captain in 2002. I met him on the first of his three deployments to Afghanistan. Activity on the base in Kandahar is constant. Aircraft landing, emptying their loads of military supplies, and promptly taking off. Perimeter patrols try to keep those planes and the base safe. But safety also means getting off the base and into the communities. If there are people that are threatening the airfield, they're going to be amongst the local population. So we try to keep the local population on side with us. That tour of which you just showed video, that was the first time that I got to participate in history as it was happening. Like 9-11 happened, and then like four months later, we're there in Afghanistan. And it really mattered. And people really cared. And like, I was like, whoa, like I'm not going to get a lot of chances to participate in big events very often. And a life should not be defined by big events. A life should be defined by small moments of kindness and generosity and participating as a citizen. But, but I knew I had a limited window to do big things. So I dreamed big for that seven months. But in terms of wins over the long term, I can't, I, I keep my, my life small. I don't try to answer those questions anymore. Those questions are especially hard to answer not just for Alex, but the others in his regiment, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. They suffered the first Canadian losses of Afghanistan. A deadly error and four dead Canadians. They have sacrificed their lives in the name of Canada. Who they were, how it happened, and what's being done to make sure it never happens again. In this very spot, Canadian soldiers were conducting a live fire night training exercise. Then, an American fighter pilot high above apparently thought they were shooting at him and his F-16, so he bombed them. Four Canadian soldiers died, eight others were injured. On behalf of myself and all members of the 3 PPCLI battle group, I'd like to express our sincerest condolences to the families and friends of our fallen comrades. The tragic event that took the lives of Sergeant Mark Leger, Corporal Ainsworth Dyer, Private Nathan Smith and Private Richard Green has left massive holes in our hearts and our lives. Pat Stogren is retired now. He was the Lieutenant Colonel in charge when those soldiers died. From my world, from the journalism world, the actual deployment and then friendly fire were the biggest two news events. What was it, what were the biggest parts of that deployment for you? Well, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sorry to say that it's friendly fire, but yeah, it no, was, no, no, right? No, no. I, I think uh, I, I, it's associated with friendly fire. You know, uh, the memory of uh, Mark, and it brings tears every time I say it. But it, it's it's just the way I react. But Mark Leger, Ainsworth Dyer, Richard Green, and uh, and Nathan Smith. Friendly fire is the most demoralizing way to lose troops. It would have been easier to take if we were under fire at the time with the enemy. That was not the case. Lauren Ford was a 33-year-old sergeant when he was injured by friendly fire. You don't sound angry, though. Uh, there was a time I was very angry. Like, right now, now I, guess the, I guess the anger might be gone, but the unnecessary results of what happened are what's hard to deal with. But as time goes on, you just want to remember the guys for what they were. They're, you can't change a fucking thing, right? It happened, it happened. 158 soldiers died in Afghanistan. Thousands more suffered physical and psychological injuries. There were also deaths by suicide after soldiers returned from their deployments. 2008 closes out with 32 Canadian soldiers killed this year alone. 
Canada's defense minister and NATO officials warn next year is likely to be much more violent. Over the 12 years that Canada fought here, I went back seven more times. How many deployments do you do in total? Uh, in my career, I did four, two in Afghanistan. The second one, I was blown up. So I, I spent a lot of time outside the wire, a lot of time outside the wire, because I had four teams operating day in and day out, patrolling and, and working with the Afghan National Army. Unfortunately, I think I just rolled the dice one too many times, and it caught up with me. Major Mark Campbell nearly died in June 2008. We were doing a village sweep operation, and uh, um, the first village went fine. Um, we had a Canadian platoon on our right side protecting that exposed flank. And they got into a big roaring firefight. A Canadian sergeant was shot. Uh, he was, he, it was assessed that he was going to die if they didn't get him out uh, from shock and blood loss. And uh, we were ambushed. Uh, and they hit us from three sides with, well, they blew me up. And RPG? They hit, uh, I was blown up by uh, an IED, IED, command detonated IED. Can I, uh, can I ask you, last August, you see everything falling apart, guys hanging on to an American cargo aircraft, yeah. trying to get the hell out. Yeah, yeah, that was a nasty, uh, was a nasty bit of work. So you've got five-year-old girls who are now 25-year-old girls, partway through a university education, who are suddenly told, you're not going to school anymore. Oh, by the way, that future you thought you were going to have based on the last 20 years of your life? Yeah, that's not going to happen either. So where does that, that leave you? That, that's pretty brutal. Yeah. Where do you think that leaves you? Where does that leave our country with well, the investment that we made? I, I, I think we as a country have failed on the back end of our obligations to Afghanistan. But we should be doing a lot more than what we did. And we should be doing a lot more now than what we're doing, in my, my humble estimation, to get those vulnerable Afghans out of there. Because the job's not finished un until we get them out. Particularly the people we worked with directly, who, who put their lives on the line to assist us. Do you think it was all worth it? At the end of the day, I have no regrets. I think what we did was, um, particularly in the beginning, was, was a virtuous mission. We went there for the right reasons, to do good works for good people. We should never have withdrawn contact with the enemy. We should have stayed there until the job was done. How, how do you put it into, I mean, I was, I was not a soldier there, but I, I'm a Canadian. But I, I have some trouble reconciling all of the effort that Canada's military and Canada put in, in blood and treasure. Um, but, you know, I, I, there are people who say uh, it wasn't worth it, or it was all for naught. I think that some change happened. The country has changed. Is it all for naught? I don't know, you know, because we only have two sides to our head, so it's either all for the better or all for the worse. Yeah. No, there are some great stories coming out of it, but I think it was, I would never butcher soldiers for the outcome that we had there. It was a real privilege to touch base again with uh, so many of those soldiers. Amazing to see what they're up to now and a chance for all of us to talk about Canada's long mission in Afghanistan. Up next, the path to reconciliation includes calls for reforming the justice system. I have 107 criminal code convictions, uh, all for drug trafficking and weapon trafficking. The Saskatchewan group that's trying to turn lives around one smile at a time. Plus, the birthplace of Confederation is getting a new lease on life. We go behind the scenes of a massive restoration. As the new year approaches, thoughts turn to new possibilities. But for people who've been through Canada's criminal justice system, 
Moving past trauma can be difficult, especially for Indigenous women and men facing disproportionately high incarceration rates. Nick Purden went to see how an Indigenous-led program in Saskatoon helps former inmates rebuild their lives and their faith in the future. I woke up one morning and my daughter was my cellmate and I said, what are you doing here? And she said, I got picked up for attempted murder. And it was at that point in my cell, I was like, I need to stop. Everybody here in this room has spent time in jail. And this circle is the reason they're now free. I came to this organization, fresh out of prison, full of attitude, stubborn, full of ego. I thought I knew everything. When Chantal Hewell decided to change her life, she came here to this group. It's called Straight Up. Straight Up is a group, a family that motivates each other, that pats each other on the back when you do good, you know, listens to you when you're struggling. Devin Napope started going to jail when he was just a teenager. And he represents a pretty startling statistic here in Saskatchewan. Indigenous people make up only 12% of the total population. But in the prisons here, 70% of the inmates are Indigenous. Everybody's here because you've been incarcerated at some point. You've had ongoing problems with the law. I guess what I want to know is, is if you can speak personally for yourself, how did it start? The people around me were all addicts. So I grew up hating and just being depressed about all of this. I used to pour drinks out of my granny's cup, my mom's, and just telling me, please stop drinking. So I was destined to go to the correctional, the penitentiary. Devin hasn't been back to jail since he joined Straight Up. Could it be that a support group like this one is a way to help people stay out of prison? Here they say the first step to solving your problem is understanding how it started. Chantal is 45. She spent 15 years in and out of jail. So for myself, uh, I am a product of trauma. I'm a product of rape. My story started began, or before, before I was even born, right? And that's all I know about myself. That's all I know about where I come from. And I was an angry child, and uh, I was a violent child. My addiction led me to selling drugs for, uh, to support my habit. And, and that's how I started going to jail, right? Uh, I have 107 criminal code convictions, uh, all for drug trafficking and weapon trafficking. Um, We've talked enough about the past. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, we, what, what, what we need to do now, if we're gonna do anything, is talk about what it is that Straight Up does. That's Andre Polyev interrupting. He started Straight Up 20 years ago. And since that time, Straight Up has helped thousands of people try to turn their lives around. Let me ask you, how does Straight Up, how does being here with, with your peers, how does this help you? Well, you come over here and you feel refreshed, whether that's from the smiles or the hugs or the raw stories you hear from one another. Straight Up is like a beacon of hope, like natural spring water with healing in it. Oh, I can't top the waterfall thing. <laughs> Let me think of something, yeah. That's Rodney Nauticapo. Um, so how straight up has helped me? Uh, man, there's so many times where I couldn't rely on my family because they're either in jail or they're drunk or they're hungover or they didn't have the capacity, the social capacity to give me the support that I needed. But it's a reality. Peer support is big here. But there are also very concrete things that Straight Up does. Andrea DeRocher was released from prison recently into an apartment run by Straight Up. They give people coming out of jail a place to stay until they're able to make it on their own. Welcome. This is my home. When you look around your apartment, what do you, what do you think about? It's a place where I feel safe. Like... I see myself succeeding, staying sober. Um, after I get my grade 12, I want to get into a trade, heavy duty mechanic. 
when you get out of being in jail, you have nothing. So you have to start fresh. And then I'm lucky to have a warm bed. Nice. Yeah. And a, a dresser. Yeah. This is my bathroom. It's not nice. very big. <laughs> Coming out from being in jail, yeah. This is nice. Like, it's like living the dream. Who knows if Andrea will turn her life around. But this apartment gives her a fighting chance. And that's what Straight Up did for Chantel as well. They set her up to succeed at her latest parole hearing. So I went into my parole hearing with uh, a circle of people. I had 14 supports in my last parole hearing. And they said, you're a high risk to reoffend. We don't want to release you. But the amount of support that you have with you speaks volumes to the work that you put in your healing, right? We're going to grant you day parole. And they released me again, and they've never seen me again, right? Chantal is an individual success story here. But Rodney wants people to know the bigger issue about why there are so many Indigenous people incarcerated in Saskatchewan. For me, I went to residential school. From residential school, I went to jail. Residential school for me was a mini version of jail. It just got us prepared for what we were. And many, many people in jail right now, that's, all, that's what they say. Oh, it's just a big residential school. That legacy is what people are up against. And straight up gives them a chance to change that. Now that I believe that I can have a life aside from addiction, aside from violence, aside from self-hate, then that gives me a, a new sense of hope. Nick Purden, CBC News, Saskatoon. After the break, we go behind the scenes at the site of a historic renovation. This is the secret room. <laughs> and we don't know what it's for? The mysteries behind the brick walls of Charlottetown's province house. Plus, a Nova Scotia man has been growing this giant poinsettia for 26 years. His emotional connection to it is our moment straight ahead. For years now, one of Canada's most historic buildings has been undergoing a major conservation project. Province House in Charlottetown is expected to reopen to the public again next year. Tonight, Kate McKenna gives us an exclusive look at some of the work that's being done inside. So welcome to Province House National Historic Site. After falling into serious disrepair, this 180-year-old national treasure is getting a makeover. So these stairs, these are important, I think. We got a glimpse behind the scenes of this multi-year, $90 million federally funded project. This is a very important room. Um, Province House is a very unique building and it has a lot of stories to tell. The course of history was changed within these walls when the Fathers of Confederation visited here. This is where the delegates met in 1864 and where they had an initial agreement um, to talk about Confederation, the Confederation of Canada. For years, this room was kept as it looked in the 1860s. Now, it's stripped down. It's a refresh. When it reopens to visitors, Parks Canada says it'll change the narrative to include Indigenous, Black and Acadian voices. We're broadening our stories and including perspectives and voices that previously haven't been heard. But a building this old also keeps secrets. We crawled through the attic to discover a secret room that has no doors. This is a secret room. <laughs> and we don't know what it's for? It's for uh, the symmetry of the building from the outside. Okay. Would, the building would look completely different if this room didn't exist. Secret, but not glamorous. It'll be a mechanical room when the renovation is finished in 2024. So there'll be equipment up here. Okay. And there'll be a place to go and hide. <laughs> Crews have also found other unexplained oddities, like some 1950s sherry bottles in the basement and this elaborate felt wreath in the floorboards. Perhaps most strange, this etched stone face found deep inside the walls. Found it quite by mistake, it was hidden to us. With every new discovery, a reminder, history is a living thing and sometimes you have to dig to learn some new stories. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Charlottetown. Halifax resident Frankie Allison has been growing this poinsettia for more than a quarter century. A remarkable feat, but why he tends to it so carefully is even more significant. 
On Christmas Eve 1996, his wife won the plant. Sadly, she didn't live long enough to enjoy it, passing away suddenly just two days later. How her memory blooms on is our moment. Every time I look at it, well, it reminds me of her. Well, my wife won it on the radio station, and we picked it up on a Christmas Eve. It was only a little plant like that. And she passed away Boxing Day, and I had ever since. And then it kept growing and growing, so I said, I may as well keep it something to remind me of her anyway. While I was thinking about it, giving it to the library or whoever look after the plants. It sucks up a lot of water. But I said, no, if I give it away every time I come downstairs, I'll look at them. Where's the poinsettia? So I said, I'll leave it there. Hey, this is a rare one. So they say the rest of them don't last. I guess the will outlive me. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the will outlive me. I'm gonna stay till I leave. What does my granddaughter do with it? That's up to her. Yeah, it's a legacy. <laughs> yeah. It means that my wife is still with me. Yeah, that's all I can say. A lovely sentiment, an amazing feat. A great way for us to end the national for this December 26th. Thanks very much for being with us. Have a good night.